Join me on a journey as I tour cemeteries in search of unique tombstones of a bygone era while unraveling the mysteries behind the symbols, history, and the property itself. Welcome to A Walk Among the Tombstones. Mount Wood is Wheeling's oldest extant cemetery within city limits, established in 1848, but was a family cemetery of pioneer Robert T. Woods prior to that date, with the first burial in 1831. There are stones with earlier dates that were transferred from other cemeteries with the earliest dated 1817. The cemetery was designed during the rural romantic movement, which paid homage to its location's significant and unique topography, located above what was known as Jonathan's Ravine, just off the National Road, and overlooking both the Wheeling Creek Valley and Ohio River Valley, the cemetery was a popular place of internment during the mid to late 1800s. Mount Wood continued to be active until about 1950, when burials declined significantly and were infrequent, starting in the 1970s. The cemetery went into decline and vandalism caused significant damage. The cemetery was transferred to the city of Wheeling in the 1970s and upkeep was improved. The last burial was in 2003 and it entered the National Registry of Historical Places in 2013. John Luden Hobbs, born 1804 in South Carolina, died 1881 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. His father was a carpenter and joiner by trade in London, came to Charleston, South Carolina to work on a house for the governor of the state. His brother Alfred was a successful locksmith, his brother James a pattern maker, another brother Henry a wood carver. John married Mary Page in 1827. John and Mary are listed on the 1850 census as residing in Wheeling with children John Henry, Mary Elizabeth, Catherine Page, and Elizabeth Ann. Occupation is listed as glass manufacturers. They're also on the 1860 census. Mary died in 1864. Interestingly enough, John married his sister-in-law, Mary Ann, in April of 1866. Mary had been married to John's brother, Henry, who died of typhoid in 1849. John and Mary resided in Wheeling according to the 1870 and 1880 census. Both John and his son, John Henry, held supervisory positions at the New England Glass Company in Massachusetts before starting their business venture. They came to a small community near the south side of Wheeling, Virginia, to begin their new flint glassmaking company. The firm was reorganized multiple times during the next half century, but members of the Hobbs family were always part of the ownership. The most famous iteration of the company was named John H. Hobbs, Braconier and Company. This version of the firm was organized in 1863 as a co-partnership between John L. Hobbs, son John H. Hobbs, and Charles W. Braconier. Its products were mostly pressed and blown tableware. In 1891, the Hobbs Glass Works joined the United States Glass Company Trust. The trust controlled over a dozen glass plants. In 1893, the glass works was closed. It remained closed until 1902 when the property was sold to Harry Northwood, a former employee of John H. Hobbs, Braconier and Company. 
Oh, but John is at home, you see. He was interred at the Greenwood Cemetery here in Wheeling in December of 1928. What you're looking at is an empty tomb, or what they call a cenotaph. The List family were financiers and one of the many old and prominent families of the Upper Ohio Valley. The first of the family to locate to Wheeling was John List Sr., born in England, 1757, emigrated to the United States in 1806 with his family. John List Sr. died in Wheeling in 1828. His son, John List Jr., worked as a clerk for Joseph Caldwell, a pioneer merchant of Wheeling, from 1809 to 1814, then taking an apprenticeship with Mr. Caldwell. When the Pioneer Bank of Wheeling was organized in 1819, List retired from the mercantile business to be bookkeeper for the bank. This institution was succeeded by the Northwestern Bank of Virginia, in which List became teller of the same. Upon the death of the president of the bank, List became cashier until his death in 1848. During his time as cashier, the bank was robbed of $70,000 in 1832. Mr. List was able to retrieve a substantial amount of the funds. Mr. List was in every aspect a public-spirited man and took deep interest in public affairs of both his city and state. It was as a financier and a man of sound judgment and conservative ideas that he was recognized and appreciated and his influence both in banking and commercial circles was great. He is remembered not only as a public man and politician, but also one of the safest financiers in Wheeling. Mr. List left a name which survives him, serving as a monument to his exemplary life and as a model for the men of future generations to follow after. Some of you who visit cemeteries on the regular may notice coins, rocks, flowers, dolls, or other mementos on some tombstones. This gesture simply means that someone visited the grave and to outwardly show this person is still remembered. The symbolism here lies in the act itself of placing an object on a tombstone that wouldn't have gotten there unless someone purposely put it there. There's no inherent meaning to the object itself. Hypocritically speaking, however, for Jews and Christians alike, leaving stones at a grave is a nod to Genesis 13, 19 through 20, in which Jacob erects a pillar at Rachel's gravesite. By leaving a pebble at a grave, it symbolizes building a pillar to your loved one's honor. Also, coins on soldiers' tombstones do have specific symbolism. A person visiting a soldier's grave who leaves a penny means a fellow serviceman stopped to pay his respects whether he knew them or not. A nickel means they trained with the deceased, a dime means they served together, and a quarter means the visitor was with the deceased when they died. The practice of leaving coins with the deceased dates back to ancient Greeks who believed the river Styx and Acheron separated the living from the dead. A ferry trip was required to cross these waters, otherwise the soul of the deceased would be forced to wander the riverbanks for a hundred years. To avoid this, the Greeks placed a coin in the mouths of their dead to pay Haran, the ferryman. The three-link chain is the main symbol of the independent order of Oddfellows, and its presence on a cemetery tombstone indicates that the deceased belong to this fraternal organization. The three links represent friendship, love, and truth. This explains the acronym FLT within the links that sometimes appears. The independent order of Oddfellows started in England in the mid-1700s when a group of ordinary citizens established a monetary fund from their personal donations to help other group members during difficult times, such as sickness, losing a job, and even death. While the origin of the Oddfellows name appears to be lost time, one possible explanation is that other citizens in 18th century England found the selfless motives of this group unusual and considered its members an odd bunch of fellows. Regardless, in 1819, Thomas Wildly formed the first Odd Fellows Order in the United States. The stated mission of this Baltimore, Maryland lodge was to visit the sick, relieve the distress, bury the dead, and educate the orphans. This reflected the challenging social and economic conditions existing at the time due to a yellow fever epidemic as well as significant unemployment. The Oddfellows icon might occasionally appear in conjunction with different fraternal organization symbol on a headstone, such as Freemasons. This merely indicates that the deceased belonged to both organizations, which was not uncommon.
Dr. Thomas Townsend was born near Uniontown, Pennsylvania, about the year 1787. He is most well known as being the pioneer physician in Worcester, Ohio, arriving in Worcester in 1810-1811, and he stayed for about 25-30 years until he moved to Wheeling. Various sources report that he never went to formal school to learn medicine. Where he received his medical training is unknown. His specialty was botany, and he became quite adept to the interest as well as general natural science. Sciences. In Wheeling, a rumor spread of being of unsound mind because he would often be spotted roaming the hills around Wheeling, gathering bits of plants and rocks in his hat to take home for his collections. His collections of botanic and geologic specimens were unrivaled in this area. He published an account of the discovery of the Grave Creek Stone and find within the Grave Creek Mound in Moundsville in 1839 and an article entitled, on the impropriety of mercurial salivation in the Western Journal of Medicine and Surgery in 1842. Though it appeared he was more memorable for his behaviors and hobbies outside of his medical profession, he had reportedly accomplished some remarkable bone surgeries. He also served several terms as both president and treasurer of the Ohio County Medical Society. The later years were not profitable for Dr. Townsend, but he had many friends who took care of him. He died of pneumonia on March 29, 1851, at the age of 64. He was buried in Mount Wood Cemetery, and for several years his grave went unmarked until the Medical Society of Wheeling, at the urging of Dr. J.C. Hupp, arranged a memorial stone to be placed in 1873. This next person I'm going to give you a history on, I could not find their tombstone. I could not find their burial plot. I have no idea where they are in the cemetery. Even though all the history that I researched says she's there, I couldn't find her. So if anyone knows where the burial site of Eliza Clark Hughes at Mount Wood Cemetery, please comment, please tell me, please give me the reference where I can find where she is, because I couldn't find her. Eliza Clark Hughes, born 1817, died 1882, was an American physician. She was one of the first female MDs in the United States and West Virginia. Eliza Clark Hughes was born in Wheeling, West Virginia, in 1817. Her father was a prominent local merchant who had invested in lumber yards and steamboats, taking advantage of wheeling, growing economic importance in the 1830s. As such, Eliza was able to obtain a good education. Given her family's importance in the area, Eliza was acquainted with medical professionals in the area. These relationships likely inspired Eliza's interest in the medical field. When her father died in 1849, he left a generous inheritance for his daughter that allowed her to pursue her medical interests. In the 1850s, Hughes left Wheeling to study under Dr. Joseph Longshore at Penn Medical University, one of the first medical colleges to admit women in the United States. Some sources describe Hughes as being the first female MD in the state of Virginia, while others note she was only one of the first and possibly the first MD in Appalachia. In 1860, she had returned to Wheeling, advertising her services as being specialized for women and children. After the conclusion of the Civil War, Hughes continued to work as a physician in Wheeling, but sources have noted that mentions her decrease after 1870. In the 1880s, she moved to Baltimore to continue her practice, but in 1882, she returned to Wheeling. She died in May 1882 in Portland, Ohio, where she was visiting a patient. Dr. Simon Peter Hullion, born 10th of December 1810 in Pennsylvania, died March 27, 1857 in Wheeling at the age of 46. Dr. Hullion is considered the father of oral surgery. His younger brother, James, became a dentist and worked with Simon. Simon graduated from the Washington Medical College in Baltimore in 1832 at the age of 22. He first settled in Canton, Ohio, and worked as both a silversmith and a dentist. 
Then he moved to Pittsburgh. After meeting and marrying Elizabeth Fundenberg in 1835, they moved to Wheeling, where Simon set up a dental practice and became an acknowledged expert in oral surgery. His surgery practice grew so rapidly that he turned over his dentistry practice to his brother James. Simon performed over 1,100 operations for such defects as cleft palate and hair lip. In 1842, the Baltimore Dental College gave Simon an honorary dental degree. In 1850, in partnership with Catholic Bishop Wellen, he founded what would become Wheeling Hospital. Simon was also a member of Wheeling City Council and trustee to the Lindsley Institute. In 1856, Simon invited his brother-in-law, Samuel Fundenberg, and his family, who was practicing medicine in Pennsylvania, to move to Wheeling. Simon died at the age of 47 from an attack of thyroid pneumonia after an illness of 10 days. His two eldest sons were training with their father at the time of his death and went on to practice with Dr. Walter Franklin Fundenberg. Over 4,000 people attended Dr. Simon's funeral. Now I'm going to give you a quick synopsis on the history of what it took to become a physician in the early United States. Don't come for me in the comments about our current healthcare system. Don't come for me in the comments about the pharmaceutical industry. Do not come for me in the comments telling me stories about how rudely you, your grandma, your friend was treated in the ER. That's not what we're here for. Don't do it. Don't give me political stuff. Don't do it. No. In 1765, students were admitted to anatomical lectures and a course on theory and practice of physique at the College of Philadelphia. Thus began the first med school in the U.S. And don't forget, the U.S. at that time consisted of only 13 colonies. The New Jersey Medical Society, chartered in 1766, was the first organization of medical professionals in the English colonies. It was developed to form a program embracing all matters of highest concern to the profession, regulation of practice, educational standards for apprentices, and fee schedules and a code of ethics. In 1847, nearly 200 delegates representing 40 medical societies and 28 colleges from 22 states and the District of Columbia met. They resolved themselves into the first session of the American Medical Association. The AMA set educational standards for MDs, including a liberal education in arts and sciences, a certificate of completion in an apprenticeship before entering the medical college, an MD degree that covered three years of study, including two six-month lecture sessions, three months devoted to dissection, and a minimum of one six-month session of hospital attendance. In 1852, more requirements were added. Medical schools had to provide a 16-week course of instruction that included anatomy, medicine, surgery, midwifery, and chemistry. Graduates had to be 21 years of age. Students had to complete a minimum of three-year study, two years, which were under an acceptable practitioner. Between 1802 and 1876, 62 fairly stable medical schools were established. In 1810, there were 650 students enrolled and 100 graduates from medical schools in the United States. By 1900, these numbers had risen to 25,000 students and 5,200 graduates. Nearly all of these graduates were white males. The very first female granted a medical degree was Elizabeth Blackwell, who graduated from Geneva College of Medicine in upstate New York. It's important to mention back in those days, they resorted to the four humors theory of medicine. Uh, the four humors being yellow bile, black bile, phlegm, and blood. The theory holds that good health results when the four humors are in balance. Any imbalance results in an illness or a personality problem. One of the popular remedies for sickness back in those days was simply bloodletting. They would nick a vein in your arm and let you bleed for a while in a bowl and then say you were cured. 
Dentistry is one of the oldest medical professions with efforts of treatment dating back as far as 7,000 BC with the Indus Valley civilization. The history is vast and complex. I'm just going to touch a few highlights and I will be reading from these notes. The first recorded text of dental practice was in 5000 BC, noting a tooth worm causing decay. They actually believed a worm lived inside your teeth and it was the cause of decay. It would eat from the inside out. And that was a very popular theory way up until the 1700s until it was disproven. But given the knowledge at that time in their defense, it really wasn't that far-fetched because sometimes tooth decay does look like perfect little round holes that worms could go through. The Mayans are credited to being the first cosmetic dentists because they would actually carve or chip away their teeth to implant jewels or other pretty things and they would use tree sap as adhesive. Bling, bling. In ancient times and through the Middle Ages, there really wasn't a profession called a dentist. It was called a barber. And they would perform everything from haircuts to amputations. And they did what they called dentistry because they had the sharp instruments to do the job with. So the term was barber surgeon, and they were the ones who were actually doing the surgeries and dental work rather than the doctors at that time. Edward Angle started the first school for orthodontics in 1901, and he also developed a classification for crooked teeth, which we still use today. In 1723, French physician Pierre Facard, I know what you're thinking, and don't say it, don't you dare. But he was the first one to come up with fillings for teeth and wrote a book and it was groundbreaking news that, hey, sugar and acids cause decay. And for 1723, that was a big freaking deal. That was big news. That was new science. That put him on the map. In the 1870s, Colgate started mass producing toothpaste and toothbrushes. Before that, you just used rags or your finger to wipe the scum off your teeth. Let's remember throughout all this history that all these dental surgeries were done very painfully. They didn't have the benefit of analgesics and anesthesia, not like we know today. Nitrous oxide didn't show up on the scene until 1844 with the help of Horace Wells and Quincy Colton, followed by ether in 1846 by Dr. William Morton, who worked with physician Oliver Wendell Holmes, who coined the term anesthesia. Somewhere in the late 1880s, a classmate of Sigmund Freud, you know, the father of psychiatry, Carl Kohler introduced cocaine to the wonderful world of analgesics, which was liquefied and injected straight into your gum to numb the pain. Novocaine didn't show up until 1904, followed by lidocaine in 1945, which is actually what they use today when you go to the dentist. It's important to note the difference between an analgesic and anesthesia. Analgesics are more a topical or a local uh, injection just at the site to numb the pain. Anesthesia is more uh, a drug or whatever for you're completely knocked out for surgery. The more you know. <laughs> 